Hi, my name is Zach Lieberman. I'm an artist based in New York, and I'm super excited to be here, to be a part of GitHub Universe, and talk to you today about poetic computation, where specifically what I mean is how can we use code in the service of making art, in the service of making poetry? Quick introduction, I used to look like this. I studied art. I spent all of my time in the printmaking studio. I was really happy. I had to get a job. And everybody at that time was talking about web design and Y2K, and the world is going to end in the year 2000. So I applied for a job. And while there, I discovered a tool called Flash. And usually, I'm in a live, um, giving a talk in a live venue, and I'll say, who remembers Flash? And I see a lot of hands go up. Flash was this amazing tool where you could do animation on the web, you could do keyframes, and with the with very simple, um, you know, you could make things move and, and with very simple techniques. But the other thing that Flash allowed you to do is write code. It allowed you to write a line of code, a single line of code, like position.x equals position.x plus one, and then the object would move across the screen. And for me, there was something so amazing about turning language into movement. And a lot of my work kind of continue in, the, in this direction. I uh, do all kinds of projects. This is a uh, collaboration between five artists and a sixth artist named Tempt. We work together as a team. Tempt is an old school graffiti artist from LA who's completely paralyzed. And we work together to build an eye tracking system that uses the movements of his eyes to draw graffiti. So here we're taking, um, building a tool to allow him to draw graffiti again. This is a project that we did with Toyota where um, people, they have this small car, people think you can't drive them quickly. So we put colored dots on top of the car and wrote software to track it and hired a stunt driver to drive letters of the alphabet. So made a font completely out of driving. This is a project we did in New Zealand where we took your body as a starting point and then showed your body but turned into a monster, you know, three or four stories high. A lot of times the projects that I do involve the body in one way or another. So, for example, this is... Um, taking your movements and then uh, working with my friend Daito Manabe, when he's making movement on his face, he's creating shapes and the shapes come off and bounce down his face. So the idea is to kind of take take your, you know, create almost a new form of, uh, of, of mask. Um, this is a project called Manual Input Sessions that takes an overhead projector. So the kind of projector that your math professor would write notes on and a digital projector and combines them to create a kind of hybrid light source of both analog and digital. So when you make a shadow, it fills in with color. And when you let go, it makes a, a sound. Um, in addition to making art, I'm also a teacher. I help start a school called School for Poetic Computation that's based in New York. I also am a professor at MIT in the Media Lab where I run the Future Sketches group. And in terms of teaching, one of the things that you know, I think a lot about is how do I take the things that I'm learning as an artist and bring it back into the classroom? And for me, open source is a really important part of that. So I help create a tool called Open Frameworks, which is a C++ tool, uh, an open source C++ tool um, that makes it easy for you to get started kind of experimenting with video and audio and typography. And it comes out of projects like this, Mesa de Voce, where we're with um, two singers trying to imagine what the voice would look like and bringing it, those ideas back into the classroom. And oftentimes I think about open source tools as almost kind of building blocks that with some combination, you're taking all these pieces and smashing them together and see what happens. Um, one project with, made with Open Frameworks, which I really love, is called Delicate Boundaries by the artist Chris Sagru. And what she's doing is taking, the, there are these bugs on the screen. And when you hold your hand up to the screen, the bugs actually come off the screen onto your hand. And for me, there's something so beautiful about seeing artwork leave the screen. We always talk about 
leaving the screen. And here, when you actually kind of come up to the screen, these elements come off the screen onto your hand and you hold them. And to me, there's so, something so beautiful about this idea of just making things that le leave the screen. As an artist, I'm really passionate about drawing. My background is in fine arts, and I constantly struggle with the idea that drawing on a computer just doesn't feel like drawing on paper. Right? If you've ever had that experience of kind of drawing with ink or with pencil, and then you go to use Photoshop, you know, those tools are not the same. They're not equivalent to what you have in the natural world. Then I, as an artist who works with technology, I want to ask the question, you know, what what are new forms of drawing that you could do with um, computation? So the first project I want to show you is called InkSpace, and it's using the accelerometer of your phone. Your phone has all these amazing sensors in it. So you can draw on a 2D surface, but as you move your phone, the drawing moves in 3D. And what I love about making these kinds of tools, when you put them out in the world, you can see all of these th beautiful things that people do with them. So um, sometimes very like silly, childish things. Um, but for example, this woman in South Korea drew this bird. And for me, it was so beautiful. I had no idea how she could do something like this. And just to see that you can take, you build a tool, you see all these kind of amazing things that people do with it. Or this is a project that we did with, um, with Google. And Google came to us and they said, you know, we have all these um, beautiful satellite photographs from around the world. What are interesting ways of interacting with them? And we designed a tool where you draw. So it's a website, and when you draw a line, it'll find that line from somewhere in the world. Or if you draw a curve, it'll find that curve. If you draw a straight line, it'll find that straight line. If you draw a, an angle, it'll find the angle. And the whole idea is to build this very intuitive interface that uses your gesture and your expression and connects you with photographs from around the world. And projects like this, they, they have this you know, pretty front end, but they're built on software. So for example, Pixie.js is an amazing library for doing animation and interaction on the web. And also even things like vantage point trees, where we're really thinking about kind of data science issues when you're trying to do pattern matching. And you have, for example, you draw a Z, trying to f find things that look like Z, and thinking about kind of metrics and distances and, you know, pattern matching algorithm. So a lot of times, even though you see this sort of front end in the work that I do, there's a lot of back end, which is really interesting and hard um, computational problems to solve. The second part of this project is connecting the dominant line. So taking like a coastline or a highway or a river or the edge of a field. And as you drag with your finger, just stitching them together to create almost a kind of infinite canvas where um, you're taking photographs from all over the world and making a kind of a new landscape just based on gesture and movement. The last drawing project that I want to talk about is called Reflection Studies, and it's inspired by this co um, student that I had named Yuki Yoshida, who was making a booklet for his final project. He wanted to collect all of the various algorithms that you can use to tell a computer to draw a circle. So it's actually not that simple to draw a circle. There's a lot of like different um, code, different ways of writing it. And I thought of a way and I told him and then I coded it to show him. And the general idea is you start with a rectangle, the boundary, and you pick a random side. So one of four sides and you pick a random point along one of those four sides and you connect it to a random point along one of the three other sides. So now you have a line. And if that line doesn't intersect the circle, you draw it. But if it does intersect the circle, you don't draw it. So in a way, it's a form of drawing by absence. You're only drawing what is not a circle. And the more lines you draw, the closer you get to approximating a circle. And I got so excited about this idea that I tried the word love. I um, 
tried a smiley face and then i was thinking one of those lines were like rays of light what if they could actually bounce and then you could see more detail and more form so for example this is doing reflection and bouncing rays of light on top of the word love um this is refracting so so what if the b light bends as it hits the walls and when I make these sketches, oftentimes they find their way into interactive work. So here's a project where there's a light table and I'm inviting the public to come and try it. And they're putting down shapes and then the software is simulating what it would look like if light was bouncing off of those shapes. Like this is that they're immediately understandable. You come to it, you bring your body, but then it's it almost kind of starts with your body and then it goes back to your mind and then back to your body. And this pathway I find so beautiful. And by the end, people weren't even using the shape, the shapes. They were putting it down. Um, and I just found it like I just love this kind of project where you invite people to take your sketchbook and bring it to life and bring their creativity to it. Um, a lot of projects that I do involve the body in one way or another. So, um, and specifically the field that I'm really passionate about is human pose estimation. How can you understand where a body is in space? And then we can take that data and use it to drive animation, to drive art and design. And in general, you think about this almost as a kind of trying to find a skeleton. So given a, um, Given like a picture of a person, where are the elbows? Where are the wrists? Where are the hips? Where are the knees? Um, and then you can use that data in really interesting ways. So for example, this is taking the body and um, adding like almost a kind of digital costume. This is my partner Momoquo, and we've been developing these kind of um, almost kind of, uh, yeah, performative costumes. Um, this is another example of that where you see uh, like a uh, yeah costume coming to life. Um, and I think there's something really beautiful about just even thinking of human motion and what does it feel like to, to track movement. And if we can visualize it, then we can understand the kind of beauty and poetry of, 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 of body. This is taking a dancer on the street and just trying to understand her contour and the velocity of her contour and, and draw it um, and kind of in an interesting way or create a situation where she could paint with her body. And it's her movement that brings the city to life through, um, through her gestures. And I'm really interested in the body as a starting point. So specifically, what happens if you take the body and rotate it and revolve it? Do you still see a person? It, what would it look like to connect things to the body? Or um, even just take like a circle and draw around the body and see what it feels like. Do you still see a person there? Do you still see a human form? This is a project that I did with the New York Times where we, for this article, we interviewed hundreds of addicts and asked them, you know, what what did their body feel like when they went through um, addiction? And then we commissioned a dancer to dance the, those responses. So she interpreted the language that these addicts were telling us, and she dances it out. And to me, there's something really amazing about the movements. We wrote software to track the body, to, you know, to get contour, to track the data points, and then try to figure out what is the visual language that we could use to really show what what the body feels like when you go through addiction. So the way this article works is that when you scroll through it, there are these visuals that we've created. So for example, this is gateway where you see what the body, you know, this is what you feel like when you start to take the drug and tolerance when your body builds up a kind of tolerance for the drug. This is withdrawal, which is what you feel like when you stop taking the drug. Addiction, when you keep having to take the drug in order to maintain a sort of baseline. Treatment, which is what you feel like when you start taking medicine to deal with addiction. Relapse, which is what you feel when you start taking the drug again. 
And finally, recovery, which is what you feel like when you've gone through this and you start to feel your body come back to itself. And the most beautiful part of this project is at the end, there was a form where we asked people to tell their own story. And we collected hundreds of more stories of former addicts and just love the idea that this project sort of started with conversation and leads to more conversation. Another project that I want to share about the body is called Mosque La Cara, which means more than the face. Uh, and it's a public art installation in downtown Houston. And it's inspired by this spread in this book um, by Bruno Minari called Design as Art. And in this spread, he's showing you the various, like how simple it is to represent a face, that you only need just a few visual elements, like a, the eyes and the nose and the mouth. And our brains are so wired to see faces that it doesn't, it, it's really easy to make out a face. Um, and there's also a concept of periodelia, seeing faces in things. There's a museum in Japan of rocks that look like faces. I really want to go. And I want to go see the rock that looks like Elvis. That's like super <laughs> my dream to go in the future. Uh, and in general, like what does it mean? What are masks mean in culture? What does it, what does it signify that we wear masks and what are we celebrating? And, uh, and when we worked on this project, we were, we were going to downtown Houston, and every time we went, we would w do workshops with local school children. And for me, there was something so amazing about hanging out with school children and making masks. We laser cut all of these pieces of cardboard. We, we geeked out. We made masks together. And then those ideas informed our software. So we took those ideas. We wrote software. We were using a tool called Paper.js. This is a really beautiful JavaScript framework for doing... Um, kind of be beautiful animation in Canvas. Um, and we created these forms that are very simple, that are just based on um, kind of this si simple graphical ways of representing the face. And the way this project works is you approach it, it's almost like a living poster. When it finds your face, it zooms in, and then your, f your face becomes a kind of backdrop for a living poster that there's graphics on top. So. Um, and it's so beautiful to see how people interact with it and kind of see their face in a new way. Um, sorry, see their face as a kind of backdrop for a graphical form. We did all kinds of things, very silly things. Um, here's me <laughs> saying what I just said to you. Um, but you can get a sense of this, uh, this installation, kind of what it, what it felt like to use it. Um, it was just really exciting for us um, to take these ideas and then bring it out on the street and see what people do with it and see how people interact and explore um, with their body and with their gesture. The last thing I want to talk about, and then I'll talk about school for teaching for a little bit, is space. So specifically augmented reality. What does it mean that we can know where a device is in 3D? To me, that's so beautiful to think of a camera in space, a screen in space, a speaker in space, and a microphone in space. I think there are all kinds of beautiful interactions that we can create with that. Um, so for example, this is taking photographs, and the photographs stay in the air where you took them. So this creates almost a kind of fragmentary image. And there's, to me, there's something so magical about kind of photographing the world, but having the photograph float, hover where you took it, and then you wind up kind of seeing the world from these different perspectives. Or recording frames of video in the air, and then when you're done, they sort of float there, and you have to use your body to scrub them. So with your body, you're almost like the playhead for the video, and you go back and forth and control the speed of the video through your movement. This is taking photographs and exploding them in 3D. So there's one vantage point where the image looks correct, but if you move, it starts to become kind of like a cubist composition. This is um, a slit scan technique where you're taking the colors, the pixels that are in front of you and painting with them, them with the air. It's so almost taking elements from the world and bringing it back into the world, having a conversation with the world through, um, through the system. Or taking photographs and pushing them so there's one vantage point where they look correct and then um, as you move, the image starts to seem warped. And I think AR is just such an interesting vehicle and mechanism for ambiguity, for creating moments and situations that are just visually ambiguous. This is recording audio in space. And then when you walk, it replays. Mm -hmm. 
This is a test of talking and seeing what happens when we record audio in space. This is a test of talking and what happens when we record audio in space. Um, and my partner Momoko and I have been developing different apps. Like we have an app called Weird Type. This is an app called Weird Cuts, where it's you can. It's like taking collage. You take elements. You cut elements um, from around the world, and you can put them back in the world in 3D. So it's a kind of mechanism for capturing and collecting and making augmented reality. Um, and we use it in all kinds of ways. We make funky portraits. A lot of times in the studio, we're doing things like taking photographs of our eyes and nose and making kind of unique portraits. Uh, and I love when you put out tools, seeing what people do, do with them. So for example, this is a sandwich where somebody took all the elements of the sandwich and put them, you know, in in 3D, like exploded them um, out in 3D. Uh, and we're doing a lot of experiments with the body. So trying to understand what does it mean to have the body in space? So it feels like you can create almost new forms of portraiture uh, with augmented reality and also understanding kind of where the human form is. Um, or taking the body and cutting it into pieces. And then as you move, you can leave a trail and the trail sort of hovers in the air where you were. Or even doing things like recording sequences of movement and looping them. So you're creating almost a kind of like, um, like a playback or a, a, like an animation system with the world. It's very trippy. It's very hard to understand. Um, or doing things like taking the body and understanding, taking your gestures and you're kind of weaving and creating 3D forms with your hand movements. You know, taking the body as a, almost a kind of vehicle or instrument for painting. Here's similar painting, but now like a chrome shape. And as you move your hand, you make this kind of chrome form. And my studio mates are very patient with me. I'm constantly running around filming, um, trying to make figure out something that looks cool and saying like, oh, what if you, we filmed you from behind and you moved and we made a tunnel and like, what would it look like in the tunnel? And it's just experimenting, experimenting, experimenting in the studio every day. Um, and finally, most people think about augmented reality as adding a layer onto the world. But I also think it's really beautiful to think about removing things from the world. So here we're trying to remove a person. And I think this is really beautiful, this idea of, you know, through software, what can we do and how can we understand privacy? Most software is about trying to, you know, understand the body and to, um, and to yeah, understand, yeah, and, and, and surveil. And I think there's something really beautiful about kind of taking those technologies and thinking about how can we build tools to make people anonymous, to, um, to hide people or abstract them so we can tell a different story. We can tell a different story about our bodies and, and them in the world. The last thing I want to say is that I'm a teacher. Um, I, again, I'm a professor at MIT. I also help start and teach at a school called the School for Poetic Computation. And at that school, we are fascinated with um, the intersection of electronics, code, and theory. So for electronics, you're learning about gates, you're learning about the kind of basics of computation and building computers from scratch. In code, you're learning about creative coding. And in theory, you're learning about reading and writing around art. And all three of these things we focus on in service of of, uh, of making poetry with code. We do a lot of cooking and eating. Um, and I teach a class there, which is called Recreating the Past. And it's inspired by this book by Osama Sato. Osama Sato is a Japanese designer. Um, and I'm going to share this book with, him, with you. Um, he made a book in the 90s, which I really love. I realize this is not professional, but I love just sharing random stuff. Um, in my talks, this is a, uh, an amazing book, The Art of Computer Designing, um, from the early 90s. And I love the aesthetics in this book. It's all about how you can use the computer and all these different kind of yeah, techniques of rotation and symmetry, um, and using them for making art, using them for drawing. And I fell in love with this book. I, I read it cover to cover. I got so excited about all of the visual ideas in this book. And then at the end of the book, he's, the book gets crazier and crazier. And at the end of the book, he's thanking people. Um, and he said, 
in the afterward, he's thanking people. I said, I would like to um, acknowledge my favorites, Russian avant-garde, Futurism, and Bauhaus, whose brilliant typefaces and designs have in many ways shaped my own mind. If the artists of those movements were alive now to work with computers, I'm certain they would discover new artistic possibilities. The work of past ages accumulates and is remade again. And I think this sentence is so important. The work of past ages accumulates and is remade again. And I think this sentence is really powerful because it suggests that the past is there for us to engage with. And for students, I think in particular, it's a gift to say that you can, you, you can recreate the past. You can have a conversation with the past. But also it's a gift, it's an obligation to create things that, you know, that engage with the past, that to, 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 to take things from the past and, and recreate them using today's voice, today's tools. So for example, in my class, I teach about different designers like Miro Cooper, who was the design director at MIT Press and had a, helped create the, med the MIT Media Lab and had a group there called the Visual Language Workshop. And her group was focused on the intersection of typography and computation. And for me, there was something so beautiful about her work, studying her work and the work of her students. And then my students recreate her work as homework. Or Vera Molnar, who's a Hungarian artist and designer, um, and she's been doing pen plotter drawings since the um, 70s using Algol and old school languages. And my students take her work and study it and recreate it. They have a conversation with it. They reverse engineer it and they recode it using modern tools. And we were invited to show our work at a festival, and we suggested showing the code and the visual side by side. So most times when you see artwork that's created with code, you only see the output, you only see the, the visuals. You never see the underlying code. Or when you go to a website, you could say view source, but you never really see the language, the thing that makes the thing. We wanted to show these at the same time to make them equals. So for this exhibit, we set up uh, LED screens where we have text and visual side by side. And what you see on these screens are homeworks that my students made. And um, we also made a zine so you could learn about these artists. So you could see the homework, but then you could also, through the zine, learn about who, who are the artists that inspired this work. kind of like typing. And you can even see these moments where you see the, the text, the numbers change in the code, and you can see a corresponding change in the visual. And the whole idea is to, even if for people who don't know coding, for them to feel this relationship between language and form, for them to feel the poetry of text turning into visuals, that's what we were trying to do with this, uh, with this installation. And the, la the last thing I want to say is it's obviously a really strange time. You know, it, I, um, I'm speaking to you virtually. We're in a virtual conference. Uh, we're all going through this COVID situation, you know, in t together. And I was walking down the street, you know, a while ago, and I saw this graffiti on a building in Brooklyn where I live, and somebody wrote, written the word COVID-19. And I thought this was so terrible. It was like being in a really cheap science fiction movie where there's graffiti on the wall to tell you... Um, to kind of, I don't know, give you environmental graphics so you understand what's going on, or like a video game. I just felt it was so stupid that somebody had written COVID-19. And I was walking down the street the other day, and somebody had crossed all that out and written the word hope. And that gave me a lot of hope, and I hope it does for you as well. Um, I just want to say thank you. It's been really my pleasure and honor to be speaking to you today. Excited that you're taking part in this conference and yeah, happy to answer any questions. Um, thanks again. <laughs>